In our last video, we just had a great introduction to some of the terminology and notation in sets. In this video, we're going to be a little bit more involved in sets. So again, there's going to be just a lot of uh, terminology here, a lot of definitions, um, but do your best to kind of understand the basics so that as we move through the rest of this unit talking about sets, that um, you don't get lost in the notation. So here we're talking about set equality, and sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So first, notice the way that this is notated. I'm saying for all x, x is, a cell, x is an element of A, if and only if x is an element of B. And we would just write that A equals B. So let's say I have set A is 0, 1, 1, 3, 4, 4. And set B is 0, 1, 3, 4. These are equal sets. So I can say here that set A is equal to set B because even though I have a duplicate of one and a duplicate of four, there are no elements that are in one set that are not in the other set. And again, it doesn't matter the order. It doesn't matter if there are duplicates. However, if B included five, now all of a sudden A is not equal to B. So those sets would no longer be equal because B has a, a value or an element of five that is not contained in set A. Now let's talk about a subset. A subset or a set A is a subset of B if and only if every element of A is also an element of B. So let's take a look at a Venn diagram before we look at the notation that we might use. If I have a Venn diagram, a subset might look like this. So we've got some universe out here, and this would be set A, and this would be set B. So essentially what I'm saying is anything in set A is also contained in set B. So let's say A is the set of elements 1, 2, 3, and B is the set of elements one, two, three, four, five. So if I were putting these values on, on my Venn, one, two, and three would all be in set A. Four and five would be in set B, but notice that everything in set A is also contained in set B. So this would be a subset. Again, this is the notation that we would use. We're saying for all X's, if X is an element in A, then X is an element in B. And then this is the notation that we will use. So I want you to kind of think about this as like a less than or equal to B, essentially saying everything in A is in B and maybe they're exactly the same, but maybe they're not. So a little bit more on subsets. If I'm going to show that A is a subset of B, essentially I have to show that every element of A belongs to B. Oops, belongs to B. That was a horrible B. Every element of A belongs to B. So I'm saying if X belongs to A, then X belongs to B. Now, why is it important to know this? Because obviously there will be some proof involved and this is the way that we will go about that proof is to show that if it belongs to A, then it belongs to B as well. Obviously, if I wanna show that A is not a subset of B, all I have to do is find some example um, that shows that it's not true, essentially. So I'm going to find an element. If there exists some element X um, that belongs to A that does not belong to B, essentially is what I want to do. So show it belongs to A, 
belongs to set A, but not set B. And the last one says show A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now why would this be important? Because if this is true, thinking about it this way, A is less than or equal to B, B is less than or equal to A. If both of those are true, what could we state? We could state that A is equal to B. So that's essentially what we're going to do. And this one's super important because this is how you will prove that A is equal to B is to show that both of those statements are true. So you're proving that the subset of A, or that A is a subset of B, that B is a subset of A, and therefore A and B are equal sets. So now that we understand a subset, it's important to understand the difference between a subset and a proper subset. So with our subsets, we said A was a subset of B, and we used this line to denote that they could in fact be the exact same set. So here we're talking about a proper subset and note how my notation is just going to change a little bit. A proper subset says that A is a subset of B but that they are not equal to one another. Therefore, we have some element in B that's not contained in A. So let's say A was that set of one, two, three. If B was the set of one, two, three, I could say A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A and therefore A and B are equal sets. However, if B is now one, two, three, four, A is still a subset of B, but B is not a subset of A, these are not equal, and therefore A is a proper subset of B, and it's proper because we've got this one little guy in set B that is not contained in A. And again, here is the longer version using our, our predicate logic. For all X's, if X belongs to A, then X belongs to B, and there exists some element that belongs to B, and that does not belong to A. So that is a proper subset. So now we want to talk about cardinality. And cardinality is just essentially the size of your set. So cardinality is the number of distinct elements of a set, and of course distinct being important here. Let's say set A is one, two, three, 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 four, then the cardinality of A, and notice that notation is just using essentially like the absolute value bracket on each side. This is saying how many distinct elements are there? There's one, two, three, four distinct elements. So three, 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 there's three of them, so those aren't all distinct, but you get the idea. Um, so the notation, again, is just, that's what tells me that I'm finding the cardinality or the number of elements in the set. So let's say I wanted to find the number of elements in the set of the alphabet. Oops, maybe try to spell alphabet correctly. Well, there are 26 letters of the alphabet, and so that would be the cardinality of that set. The cardinality of the empty set Hopefully we all know that zero because the empty set is saying that there is nothing in the set. Now I want to introduce you to a couple of concepts that really this is just an introduction, but as we move forward through this course, we will use these concepts again and again. So the first of those is the power set. And the power set is the set of all subsets of a set. So for instance, let's say set A is 0, 1, 2. If I want the power set of A, then I want all of the subsets. So the subset would be the empty set, because again, I'm looking at these elements. I could have none of those elements. I could have one of those elements, so 0, 1, 2, 
I could have two of those elements, 0, 1, 0, 2, or 1, 2. Or I could have three of those elements, 0, 1, 2. Now keep in mind, because order doesn't matter, I wouldn't have to write 0, 1, and 1, 0 because those are the same set. So how many um, elements does the power set have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the cardinality of the power set of A is 8. And again, we'll talk more in depth about this later, but if you ever want the cardinality of the power set of a set of a set, whoa, getting crazy, of a set with n elements is 2 to the n. So here I had three elements and therefore 2 to the third was 8 and that is exactly how many we found. So this brings us to tuples and a tuple is important because basically it's an ordered collection that has a sub 1 as its first element, a sub 2 as its second element, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, obviously the way that we would have seen this most often is in ordered pairs. So a comma, say a1 comma a2, you get the idea. It's basically just two values, but the important thing here is that it's ordered, whereas when we're just looking at a normal set, we don't worry about the order, but ordered pairs, obviously the ordered pair of 5, 2 is not the same as the ordered pair of 2, 5. Those are very different points on our Cartesian plane. So I bring up ordered tuples because of the Cartesian product, which we will talk much more about when we talk about relations further along in this course. But it's essentially the set of ordered pairs, A comma B, where A, each element A belongs to the set A and each element B belongs to the set B, resulting from A times B. So let's say set A is zero and one, and set B is two, three, four. What a Cartesian product tells us to do is it's going to be all of the ordered pairs that I can create using one element of A and one element of B. So I could have 0 comma 2, I could have 0 comma 3, 0 comma 4, or I could have 1 comma 2, 1 comma 3, 1 comma 4. So again, each time I used a value from set A and an element from set B, and I've done all of the different combinations. Um, again, I said later on we'll talk about relations, but let's say I had a subset R that included just 0, 2, and 1, 2, this would be considered a relation because it is a subset of that Cartesian product. And lastly, I want to introduce to you the concept of a truth set, and a truth set essentially just uses quantifiers. So we're stating here that our domain is D and that PX is some kind of um, predicate some kind of statement that is either true or false. And the notation says, essentially the truth set is all of the values of X that belong to the domain such that P of X is true. So for example, let's let um, the domain be the integers. And let's let P of X be the statement um, that, let's see, oops, let's let P of X be the statement that X equals the absolute value of 3. So if this is the case, then my truth set 
would be any values that make this true, that x would be the absolute value of 3. And so my solution would be the set including the number 3, because the absolute value of 3 is 3, and the number negative 3, because the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. Hopefully that video was helpful to you to learn just a little bit more about sets and how we use them. And we are going to get a little bit more in depth in terms of operations of sets in the next video. So stick around.